welcome, welcome, greetings all. Uh, no questions came in today, so let's just jump right in with today's great works. As I said in my first video in this series, I don't just want to cover literature, though since it's my field, it's probably going to dominate the series. But I also want to talk about all kinds of great art, and if we're talking about great art, we might as well go right to the top. We're talking about the big one, the undisputed leader in the race to be heralded as the greatest work of all time, the most iconic painting ever executed. I'm talking, of course, about the Mona Lisa. Da, 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 da. Ah, a good deal of you will know this old story. You're in Paris, the city of romance, of Voltaire and Edith Piaf, of Ladybug et Chanoir, and it's your first time visiting the Louvre. You're just soaking up that sense of refinement and culture, and, you know, just look at all these people holding up selfie sticks and pausing to look at paintings only if their audio guide tells them to. That's how you know this is real culture. But you're here for just one reason, and that's the big one. La Giaconda herself. The lady with the enigmatic smile. Mona Lisa. You find her little spot on your map, and you head to room six. And there you see... well... Mostly a throng of people holding up their smartphones because, you know, what's the point of using your real eyes when they can't upload anything to Instagram? And yes, there are lots of paintings on the walls around you, but nobody's looking at those, unless it's by accident when they turn around for a selfie. Beyond a roped-off area and a wooden barrier and bulletproof glass, there she is. The Mona Lisa. And I can almost guarantee your first thought is going to be... Oh, I, I, I thought it was bigger. Okay, so why? Why is this painting of a woman with a big forehead, I feel your sister, and an awkward smirk on her face? Why is that the most famous painting of all time? Hmm? How did this image become the symbol of high art? Well, like most great works, it has an interesting story. And you know, since my second novel opens with the characters looking at the painting, it's something I researched a fair bit. The first thing you should know is that its popularity hasn't been constant. It's waxed and waned with the coming and going of the centuries. But its popularity outside circles of art specialists really only exploded in the last century or century and a half. Actually, a chapter of my doctoral thesis was on how the reputation of the poet Wilfred Owen is often misunderstood, and it's remarkable how similar that story is to the story of the Mona Lisa. Some will tell you that it's always been regarded as the most important painting of all time. Others will tell you that, you know, nobody really thought it was anything special until it was stolen in 1911 and all the headlines that made catapulted it into international fame. The truth is somewhere in the middle. Just like with Owen's poetry, it was popular in artistic circles as it was being created, and then after the death of its creator, it kind of became something of an obscurity, but it always had its champions in artistic circles, until eventually its reputation got bigger and bigger, and it finally became extremely well known. Certainly she was never forgotten. Uh, Louis XIV liked the painting enough to have it brought to Versailles, and um, for a time it hung in Napoleon's bedroom. Ah, the things she must have seen in there. I just uh, stole a joke from my own book. Um, copy strike me. Joshua Reynolds, the famous English painter, had a copy of the Mona Lisa that he was convinced was the genuine article while the one hanging in the Louvre was a fake. Indeed, with many early copies circulating, the idea of a faked Mona Lisa became so ubiquitous there was even a Doctor Who episode about it. Then, on top of that, the paramount importance this painting has in the art world has led to a variety of conspiracy theories. This is clearly Leonardo's self-portrait as a woman! No, 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 this is Leonardo's sneaky painting of his male lover who he couldn't paint. Why couldn't he just paint his boyfriend as a god or something? He wasn't allowed to for some weird reason. Probably Illuminati. And indeed there are a number of copies of the Mona Lisa that some contend are the real thing. But most are copies that came much later, or versions done by the students of Leonardo, not by Leonardo himself. I mean, look at this. 
clearly different from the original, right? I mean, who would look at that and think that was the work of a great master? It's positively vulgar. Ha! Gotcha! This is the Iselworth Mona Lisa, and the overwhelming consensus from art experts and forensic scientists is that this is actually the work of Leonardo da Vinci. While of course some experts disagree and there isn't 100% consensus, it's generally agreed upon that this is an earlier version of La Gioconda by Leonardo da Vinci. You could in fact argue that this is the original version. Bet you didn't see that coming. And actually the existence of this version solves some of the mysteries we've had about the version in the Louvre for the past few hundred years. Nobody can be completely sure when the Mona Lisa was painted, or in fact, who is depicted in this portrait. The Louvre dated between 1503 and 1519, which was the year of Leonardo's death. Giorgio Vasari, a 16th century art historian, wrote in 1550 that Leonardo had painted the portrait of Mona Lisa, the wife of Francesco del Giacondo. And no, I don't know how to pronounce any of those names. That story was linked to this painting, and that's how she got her two names. Mona Lisa, meaning something like Madame Lisa, with spelling that has uh, changed a little for, for modern Italian, and La Giaconda, which is a kind of play on words, which sounds like her surname, but also sounds like, you know, the one who smiles, the cheerful one, uh, the jocund one. We, we, we do use that word in English. You can't make a masterpiece without a few cheesy puns. Though this account was written in 1550, which is a long time after Leonardo's death, uh, it was actually confirmed in 2005 with a, a, a chance discovery. In the margins of an old volume of Cicero, uh, Agostino Vespucci, who was uh, the assistant to Machiavelli, and also a, uh, a relative of the explorer, Amerigo Vespucci, had scrawled a note and dated it 1503. There he said that the highly gifted artist Leonardo was working on a portrait of Lisa del Giacondo. So that's very compelling evidence that this did indeed happen, though it doesn't necessarily mean that this famous painting is the same one being described in these accounts. Indeed, the great majority of Leonardo's scholars date this painting to the latter part of his career. He's used a glazing technique that he only developed later on, and uh, experts like Carlo Pedretti said the, uh, the landscape in the background is more in line with Leonardo's scientific views from 1508 or later. So yes, what was that 1503 note about? And how come when Raphael visited Leonardo's studio in 1504, he sketched something that is quite clearly influenced by the Mona Lisa? And why did he put those columns in the background? In fact, why do so many of the copies have these columns? For a long time, it was thought that the version in the Louvre originally had these, but at some point in time, they were cut out. But a recent investigation showed that the parts cut from the sides of the Louvre version were never painted. So where did these columns come from? It certainly looks like they came from the Iselworth Mona Lisa. It's very likely that this is the version that sent ripples through the Renaissance art world and encouraged Raphael to rethink his style until he made derivative works like this. The most likely scenario seems to be that this was painted first and then the Louvre version later. And it's not at all unusual for Leonardo to have created two different versions of one of his masterpieces. Um, that's the case for many of his other works, for example, um, the Madonna with Spinner. These two versions have existed in parallel ever since, one becoming the most celebrated work of art of all time, while it was displayed in prominent French galleries while the other became an obscurity, because it was only displayed in a random manor house in Somerset. Henry Pulitzer bought this painting and uh, argued for its authenticity in a 1960 book, but his style was so overbearing and unscientific that the idea didn't really gain traction until uh, about 2012. That's when the Mona Lisa Foundation of Zurich managed to get it out of the vaults of a Swiss bank and into the public limelight. And you know, this is one of the reasons that talking about these great works is so exciting. 
Now this stuff is happening now. These are developments within the last few years about this centuries old painting. But this stuff is also recent and interesting things are still happening today. And maybe in 100 years time, we'll think of this Mona Lisa as just as important as this one. But of the two paintings, this one is the great work. The Louvre Mona Lisa is the real icon of the art world. You know, the one that's been parodied and copied a million, million times. You know, the one that everyone uses for artistic statements and protests. And people are always trying to deface it or destroy it. You know, even when it came here to peaceful Tokyo in 1974, Somebody tried to attack it with some red spray paint. Of the two versions, it is also a much better version of Leonardo's Sfumato style. Sfumato? Just Sfumato? Uh, uh, I don't know. Let's look it up. Italian Sfumato. Sfumato. Which is, you know, the, the painterly technique where brush strokes are expertly blended to give a, a soft, glowing effect that really draws the eye's attention to the lighter parts of the painting. I would say that both paintings are part of Leonardo's legacy. One early, and one late. One not widely recognised and one extremely well recognised. But we should totally celebrate having both. I wanted to talk more about Leonardo's life, but if I do that, this video will definitely run too long. So I'll, I'll leave that for when I talk about one of his other masterpieces. Yeah. He has plenty of them, after all. There is no denying that this painting is one of the greatest of the great works. The simple portrait with enigmatic elements like the smile and the hands, plus the strange dreamlike background, have led to an extraordinary degree of scholarship and analysis. And I do have to say, well, personally, I don't really like it. You know, as masterworks from great painters go, I just don't feel it really stands out. It just feels somewhat arbitrary that it became the most well-known painting of all time. You know, why not La Belle Ferronniere or, or Bacchus? I just don't think the compositions Marto and, you know, enigmatic smile elevated to the heights it has achieved. You know, in large part, it's famous for being famous. Not that I'm going to draw a parallel with a Kardashian or anything like that. Oh, no, 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 no. And yes, I do think that if not for the theft of the painting in 1911 by an Italian nationalist who thought it, it belonged in Italy rather than in France, we probably would have a different painting to call the most prominent and famous of all time. Nonetheless, it certainly is beautiful remarkable and masterly. And after all, great art is in large part reputation. And there's no getting around that. So without any great love or passion for the painting, I do concede that it is absolutely a great work. But it is also my opinion that if the Louvre Mona Lisa is recognised as a great work, so too should the Iselworth Mona Lisa be recognised. True, its background, usually called unfinished, is inferior, but to my eye it has many valuable qualities. The portrait itself is just as beautifully executed, and the, you know, the larger scale, the younger subject, and the interesting framing are all important elements to consider. So I feel absolutely justified in saying today we have covered not one, but two great works. Okay, my first foray into the world beyond the literary. Though I have now crossed the Rubicon, the main focus of the channel will remain novels, plays and poems. But there are plenty of other great works to talk about, and not just historical great works, maybe some contemporary ones too. You know, if I, if I want the channel to grow, I feel like maybe I should talk about some more modern stuff. For now though, that is all, and I will see you again next time for another great work!